imagine that you are a developer. Hopefully this is easy, because you probably are. Now imagine you're going to start a new UI. You've worked with UI Kit for years, but recently you've heard about Swift UI. Why is there so much excitement about Swift UI? What's the big deal? Well, one of the first uh, Swift only frameworks from Apple is Swift UI. Swift UI uses structs based on protocols. It's simple to read and simple to write. It has a very elegant relationship with your data model. It's very lightweight. Um, there's no auto layout or storyboards. There's a live preview with Canvas. And it has fewer bugs. So let's take a look at the protocol that backs with UI. It has a single read-only property called body. We implement this as a computed property, and it just returns a view. It's very simple. Here we have a list of primitive views. Text, image, color, shape, spacer, divider. An important part of Swift UI is that it's based on composition. We start with smaller, single-purpose views and combine them to make larger, more complex views. This is what a simple Hello World app looks like in Swift UI. We have a custom view that conforms to the view protocol. It has a computed property that returns a view. In this case, just a text label that reads Hello World. There it is. Swift UI has a really elegant relationship with the data. So when working with Swift UI, every piece of data has a single source of truth. The views are redrawn based on the state of the data. Views are created and destroyed quickly so the UI, so the UI always represents the data. Working with data in Swift UI introduces some new property wrappers. The first two, state and binding, I'm just going to go through briefly but not spend too much time on. These are really for internal UI only. And I mention that because if you try to use them outside of your, um, your views data model, things will not end well. This is not for your, uh, the data model of your app. It's not for your, um, your custom views, or your custom data, rather. It's for internal use only. And Apple actually recommends that you uh, mark these as private to prevent you from, from breaking things. The next one is uh, environment. Environment stores the environment state of the entire uh, hierarchy. Then we have the observed object and environment object. These two are the different ways of monitoring the changes of your custom classes. Environment. The environment in SwiftUI is a lot like the trait collection in UIKit. It contains a set of environment values, like locale, calendar, color scheme, and font which are available to every view without having to be explicitly passed in. So how does that work? In Swift UI, we have a view hierarchy, much like we would in UIKit. But we also have an environment hierarchy, which is parallel to the view hierarchy. When the environment value changes from an ancestor, that change is propagated down to the child and becomes available to the corresponding view. Keeping track of environmental changes is cool, but what's even better is keeping track of the changes to your custom classes. In order to have your custom classes participate dynamically in Swift UI, you can have them conform to the observable object protocol. This basically declares your class has properties that announce changes over time. To configure your properties to announce changes, you just prepend your property with the publish property wrapper. There are two ways of listening to your custom observable objects in your Swift UI view. The first is observed object, property wrapper, which you simply create an instance variable, initialize with your custom class, and mark the property wrapper observed object. If the view then uses this instance variable anywhere in this calculation for its body, whenever the property changes, the view recalculates. In this way, the view is always in sync with the model. When the model changes, the view updates. The way you pass an observed object to other views is similar to the way it's done in UIKit and with a view controller. So basically, you create an instance of your data model, you pass it from view to view using initializers and instance variables. Notice the, blue, the views in blue here uh, may not necessarily 
need the data from the view, and the views in yellow do. Even if the views don't need the data, they have to kind of hold on to it like a courier along the way, which is okay, but not particularly elegant. The other way of listening to your custom observable object in SwiftUI is using the environment object. And here comes the elegance. Using environment objects lets you inject a custom observable object into the environment, which then makes it available to all descendant views without having it passed explicitly. So here, we see a custom object from our model being injected into the environment, and now our data is available to all views, and no longer need to pass the data from view to view, only the views that uh, need it um, uh, will request the data. In addition to the changes of how we handle data, there's no auto layout, which means there's no constraints, which means no conflicting constraints, no unsatisfiable constraints. There's also no storyboards, which means no storyboard board, uh, merge conflicts. We don't have storyboards, but we do have a live preview canvas. The changes in code update the canvas, and the changes in the canvas update the code. As you see here, as we type the name Turtle Rock in code, it's updating in the canvas, and if we were to change it in the canvas, it would also reflect in the code, because the view always reflects the data. Between data handling and the lack of auto layout, SwiftUI gets rid of two entire classes of bugs. We no longer fall in the situation where the UI can be out of sync with the data model. Because of this and the lack of auto layout, we no longer have any auto layout bugs. So why not use SwiftUI for everything? Well, of course, there's a catch. SwiftUI isn't exactly complete. SwiftUI has many of the peer interview types we use regularly. However, there are a few elements still missing. Still, sorry. <laughs> there are a few elements still missing, such as <laughs> collection views, page control, toolbars, search bars, progress bars, text views, image picker, AV player, and I ran out of room on the slide. There's more. Um, <laughs> so some of these are pretty easy to make custom versions of. For example, a toolbar. You can use compositional layout in. Uh, you can use composition with SwiftUI to make things. But others, like text views and AV players, there really isn't a possible way to make it with composition with SwiftUI. So as much as I'd wish I could tell you to use SwiftUI all the time, it's not currently possible. But what if we can combine UIKit and SwiftUI? As it turns out, SwiftUIKit, SwiftUI and UIKit are completely compatible. There are two ways of integrating these frameworks. You can start fresh with SwiftUI and add UIKit as needed, or if you have lots of existing UI code, you can start with a UI kit and add SwiftUI where it makes sense. First, let's look at the case where we start with fresh SwiftUI and then add UIKit. In order to encapsulate UIKit and SwiftUI, we create an object that conforms to the representable protocol. The two representable protocols we work with in iOS are the UI view representable and UI view control representable, corresponding to each of those. We have required make and update methods, as well as an optional make coordinator and an optional dismantle. What is a coordinator, though? So, creating a coordinator is only required if you need to handle delegation or respond to target action methods. UIKit relies a lot on the delegate pattern, but SwiftUI is mostly, um, SwiftUI is all structs, and delegates don't really work so well with structs. So we need to handle, U when we need to handle UIKit delegate, we define a coordinator object. We then have this object conform to whatever protocols needed to handle the delegate calls. The two required methods in the representable object are make and update, each of which inject a context. What's the context? So the context is composed of three elements. It's the environment, which I mentioned before, a transaction, which keeps track of animation, and the optional coordinator, which uh, we also talked about. And then it, there's a dismantle which you can optionally call if you need to do some teardown uh, later on. If we implement the make coordinator method, it's called first. Make is only called once and returns the initialized UI kit object. Then update is called whenever the context properties change. That's if the environment changes, the coordinator changes, or the transaction changes. This is not if your data model changes, which is 
important to know. This update is not called when your data changes. Let's talk about injecting data. With native Swift UI, data objects can easily be injected into and monitored by views. One way this is done is with the environment, via environment objects. Unfortunately, these don't currently work with um, views conforming to representable protocol. So if you want to inject data, it needs to be done explicitly via an initializer. One of the best parts of Swift UI is that we no longer need to refresh the UI when the data model changes. Swift UI views are a function of state and are rapidly destroyed and created as the data model changes. This is also true for objects that conform to representable. When the data model changes to an ancestor, the uh, representable view is redrawn. However, if you have data that changes frequently, you quickly notice the performance deficiencies in UIKit as new objects are created and destroyed. Here's an example I have of an app that I was working on. Um, it has a text field and some scrolling carousels. I had my scrolling carousels with collection views. I like those. So I want to kind of bring them over. This is the text field. I have a carousel that shows notebook covers, one for accent colors, a third for font selection. Every time I change the text field, though, the text changed, which caused all the other views and descendants to be withdrawn with every keystroke. So every time I typed a letter, I had three collection views being withdrawn. This performance is horrible. If you remember one thing from my talk, avoid using UIKit objects in places where they will be created and destroyed frequently. They're not built for that. So what if you already have a pretty mature app with lots of work already completed in UIKit? How can you add UI views to your existing UI code? Here's how you bring UI views, sorry, this how, here's how you bring Swift UI into UIKit. The first way is in code. You instantiate an instance of UI hosting controller and it initializes the root view property with an instance of your Swift UI view. Now you use that hosting view controller instance as you would any view controller. That's basically it. Of course, you can use a storyboard. For this, you can add a hosting view controller to the storyboard canvas. The hosting controller is on, on the right. Uh, we're using our hosting controller as a detail view, so there's a segue between the table view and the hosting controller. iOS 13 has a new segue action that returns a UI hosting controller. This allows you to do some customization to your UI view before it's displayed. The previous example showed a detail view controller that was implemented with SwiftUI. That's a common case. Something I've been playing with recently, though, is using SwiftUI for my table or collection view cells. Here I have a SwiftUI view, but I've added an extension. It first converts to a UI hosting controller and then returns the view property of that hosting controller. Then I have a method in my custom cell that handles the layout. I grab the instance of my SwiftUI view, convert it to a UIKit view, and then add it to the hierarchy. This is a little unconventional, and normally you don't want to use a view controller in a cell, but so far my performance has been pretty great, and I like to try new things, and I encourage you to do the same. While SwiftUI is not complete, uh, I do think it's clearly the future of UI on iOS. Whether you're starting from scratch with a purely SwiftUI implementation, retrofitting your existing code to include SwiftUI, or working on something in between, now is the perfect time to start looking at this new framework to see what it can do for you. Merci.